Hi there, welcome to week nine. Today, uh, we're finishing our module on, on media discourses. And we're finishing with the idea, with the, the clashing idea or the contrasting idea of mer mer meritocracy and inequality. Uh, before I get into the lecture, I think it's important to at least have a sense of uh, the two assigned documentaries, the meritocracy in Singapore and, uh, and work in Bapur. Those two documentaries, even if you're not able to fully watch the, the entire, both entire documentaries, the two documentaries, have a sense of what um, they, they're talking about and especially the different cases they put forward. Um, because they are really complementary, and then and, and they will help you uh, understand further the the concept of meritocracy, which really is very contextual, and and I'm only touching the surface of the of the more um, theoretical or grander lines of argumentation when it comes to meritocracy as is understood. Uh, via inequality. So it's good to get those uh, windows into more specific uh, examples of how meritocracy and inequality works hand in hand in two transnational contexts, the context of Singapore and the context of the of, of, of Europe, uh, basically, which is working the documentary on working back poor. Uh, but then let's get into into the in, into this into in, in, into into try to grapple what um, what these two clashing ideas uh, really mean uh, at a at least at a at a conceptual level. And I I really wanted to start with. One one of the underlying um, uh, factors when it comes to meritocracy is that we uh, oversee, we do not focus on its consequences. And one of the uh, major consequences of having a meritocratic uh, a society based exclusively based on meritocracy, or even just or, or being bombarded by meritocratic um, uh, discourses in the meet on the media is that we either don't focus on poverty and the issue of poverty, and or and or the debate around poverty is completely. Um, skewed and and framed badly, because in the end, in a under the meritocratic premise, the question to the question of do the poor then deserve to be poor? Do they deserve their poverty across uh, national uh, national systems of government? Uh, the answer would be yes whether that's implicitly or explicitly put, the answer will be yes, they deserve the poverty. And, and you may think that this is somewhat a, a caricature or exaggerated, but really you need to, um, one has to think about uh, that not so much the explicit discourse around poverty because explicit discourse about poverty has to do with the mitigation of poverty, how we can decrease poverty. So, but the, what is actual governments across the world do when it comes to poverty. And one thing that gov governments across the world have when it comes to poverty, and here, you know, obviously it's a vast generalization, uh, but similar governments, any comparison that you want to draw around, you know, developed democracies, for instance, or um, or the OECD, if you want to put it like that, and we're going to restrict the 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 generalization a little bit more. In, within countries of the OECD, uh, you will see that there that welfare systems are heavily policed, that welfare recipients and their monies they receive are 
are closely monitored. Every little cent is closely monitored. And the experience in Australia with job seeker and robot debt, uh, it's a just it's it's an outstanding example of that. But you can have multiple examples around the OECD countries, and that is always the case. And that contrast with how little we know when it comes to military spending. There is very little breakdown on what of what monies the military spend, how much specifically they spend on, and why. And not only the military, but you know, national security agencies, um, all the subcontractors that happen. Why is it that they're using it? Uh, why their projects and their budgets are so big, and what is the breakdown exactly? Um, and why are they precisely needed? There is very little accountability. And, and we can start making these comparisons with the things that governments um, uh, really take for granted when it comes to the budget, for instance. you know, for, Police is another example. Um, uh, what are the effects of policing different communities? Is it effective? Is it not effective? Uh, basically, any discourse around law and order gets a pass when it comes to uh, budget proposals. And anything around welfare, uh, it's heavily scrutinized. And that's precisely has to do because of this caste system that, um, that uh, liberal democracies are based on when it comes to mer meritocracy. And I, when I say a caste system, uh, it's, it's mostly a metaphor, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very pertinent metaphor because it really casts people into, into these different classes according to what they deserve, uh, uh, according to the ideology of merit and according to uh, meritocracy. Um, and that's why the, the poor are are um are monitored very heavily because you uh because it's always thought or implicitly thought that they will be cheat their way out of their poverty because in the end if you deserve your poverty then there is something almost genetic in you to deserve that poverty and if if you don't if you're not if we don't monitor you closely you will mismanage the money on the assistance that we, I want to say, we, the governments, uh, give you, right? And the problem with this debate is only that it's not true, or that is a like badly, um, um, that that it's um, unfair, really. Uh, it, it's just that it puts us on a on on a debate, puts it puts it on a on puts a debate. On, on on the on the wrong on the wrong angle it it's a uh, it's 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 not focusing uh on the on the real issue when it comes to poverty and when it comes to meritocracy and that's what i'm going to try to do and uh matthew desmond's uh who just came out with a book called uh, poverty by america puts it in beautifully when he talks about how the poverty debate is badly framed and I'll just play just a clip of how he actually talks about this. And I mean, it seems like a simple question, why, right? But it, as your book points out, it's the answer is very complicated. And I think a lot of people have one answer that they'd like to attribute to why, but in reality, it's not so simple. Can you walk us through some of the reasons? I mean, you open your book with this question, why is there so much poverty in America? Can you walk us through some of the answers to that question? Sure. So the novelist Tommy Orange has a line that goes, um, these kids are jumping out of burning buildings, falling to their deaths. And we think that the problem is that they're jumping. And when I read that, I was like, that sounds like the American poverty debate. We've mm -hmm. spent so mm -hmm. much time focusing on the poor when we should have been focusing on the fire. Who lit it? Who's warming their hands by it? So this is a book about the fire. It's a book about how many of us, and by us, I mean those who are, are privileged, who have found some economic security in this country, how many of us benefit from poverty in ways that are that are known and unknown to us. Right, and you can go, Matthew Desmond goes into that. So who's benefiting from poverty and the, fight and the different type of fires that create poverty? And one of those fires 
is meritocracy, is the ideology of merit. Of merit. Um, the ideology of merit um, locks in poverty or the ability to justify poverty and justify a certain type of class privilege. And uh, that is one type of fire. Um, and the irony when it comes to meritocracy is that really the term was coined by Michael Young in this in, in his satire uh, titled The uh, Rise of the Meritocracy in the late 50s. And, and it was really a word, a term that was meant to satirize uh, British society as a dystopian um, community obsessed with artificial merits. Um, but it ended up with the passing of time as a positive term to justify our stratified society today, um, especially our stratified developed societies. But this thing, the, the idea of meritocracy, even though it, it could be a little bit of a theoretical stretch because when we generalize too much and we apply this to the to global um, global inequality, it might be too much of a stretch. But even if just if we just use it as a metaphor, the idea of a meritocratic system at, in the global order is it's just just it's justifying the different pecking orders when it comes to um, to economic inequalities at the global level, uh, but at the national level, at the national level, it certainly is one of the ideological engines of our stratify of our hierarchical systems, stratified society and hierarchical system, um, and and really one of the most effective justifications for this stratification, for this division in hierarchies within society has to do with, uh, with the main, one of the main tenets of meritocracy, which is, which is the myth of the equality of opportunities. The idea that everyone in democratic, in liberal democratic societies have equal opportunities. And the main issue with that is not so much that it's not true, because it could have been true at certain moments in, in, in history that uh, depending on uh, political change, for instance, uh, a certain generation had somewhat equal opportunities uh, in that context. And if you go back to the uh, documentary in Singapore, that the case is made that in the 60s and the 70s in Singapore, there was a leveling of the playing field when it came to, um, to social opportunity and economic opportunity. The problem is that this opportunity, it's a myth because it's always relative. It's unstable and it's unreliable. And, and the equality uh, requires that the very gifted have their gift rewarded at that moment, that the very gifted at that moment that are competing for equality and that actually make it um, over other people have their gift rewarded. But even before we get to there, you could have at one point an equal society in terms of opportunities, but then after that generation uh, is passes the torch to the next generation, what you have is in a very unequal society that is being unequal on the back of that equality. So equality is always broken very quickly. That's why it's always relative and it's unstable, it's unreliable. And not only that, and here I follow Michael Sandel's argument, uh, which is, um, he has a, it's a great book. His book is The Tyranny uh, of Merit. Uh, but that there's, we, we're, we're only reading two, um, two uh, small articles uh, on his book. Uh, and in one of the, in the first article, in part one, he puts like this, and has to do with the gift and the gifted, right? How the gift, the, the gifted uh, have their gift 
rewarded at a certain moment and not another, how that actually changes the picture. If you think about LeBron James, he uses the uh, the 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 metaphor of LeBron James. If Le LeBron James would have been born in the Renaissance, right, in the 1500s, um, his athletic merits wouldn't have counted for much uh, because the um, merits were around, you know, uh, uh, artistry about being able to paint, do beautiful, make, make um, beautiful paintings. Right? Um, it's sort of a very um, out there metaphor, but it, it really exemplifies that that it the gift at this moment in history that we reward as a society, i.e. I. intellect and doing well on tests and and going into a specific category of, uh, of, um, of subjects, of degrees, uh, that wasn't the case just some 20 years, 30 years ago, of course, not 100 years ago, right? Uh, so it's always relative. Uh, and con and we need to contextualize it, and that's why it's basically a myth, um, because it's never it's not universal and it's not even remotely equal across history. Right? In this sense, meritocracy is the enemy of equity. And when we think about equity, basically equity means fairness. But in in here, I'm referring to social equity, so that which means really social justice, right? A society that is organized around principles. Of social justice, uh, um, and not only is the enemy of equity, is a promoter of inequality, precisely because merit locks people in to metaphorical caste of their merits of their gifts, and then justify what I've referred before as neoliberalism and the and and. And the and the model of neoliberalism, neoliberalism is a winners take all mentality, and this and I, it is an ideological justification that truly stifle the possibility of social change, right? And you could only have minor reforms at the edges of the system, because if uh, uh, because if you have a system in which everyone is run ranked according to their merits and to their talents and their efforts, uh, the ones who are ranked at the bottom deserve to be ranked at the bottom. And so, and, and their children and their children's children deserve to start at that, at that, in, that, in the order that their parents uh, were ranked at that moment, right? So you justify social justification. Um, and everyone then deserve what they get. And of course, when you put it like that, most people would disagree with it. Uh, but here's where you have to really parse through uh, the media scape and see how this ideology, it's implicitly, um, um, it's, 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 it's implied, it's implied across the board when we talk about for, when when it's talk when success is uh, is talked about with any type of merit uh it's shown uh and visualized uh across different types of media right it it's it, it's everywhere um in a very implicit manner right um but ultimately we need to ask ourselves and that how is it then if if everyone gets what they deserve and the meritocratic system uh it's uh, it's only a matter of talent plus effort right you will you will see uh you would have to see social mobility upward social mobility of individuals that actually are flying through the through through the ranks of this meritocratic peg order. But what you see is when you especially look at the US, which is uh, virtually the most individualistic meritocratic society that I can think of at least. And when you look at that, what you see is really the decline of upward social mobility 
the decline of upward social mobility at different levels of society, right? And this is called, goes across uh, the board in American society. And there is a reason why there is a decline in upward social mobility. And that has to do because uh, individualistic meritocracy, it's simply an ideology. It has, it's unrelated to the structures and the governmental system that promote inequality. And the US is a, it's a, it's a greatly unequal society, right? And especially unequal since the eighties, uh, when we have, when, when we have the neoliberal system, um, basically raging across the board in all sectors of uh, American society. And I'll just show you a couple of graphs just so you have them there that basically uh, justify uh, or, or, or reinforce really the, the what I was just saying. Um, and and there, there are multiple graphs and when you look at this um, and how um, the, the, the share of children making more than their parents is completely declining until the 80s. And it even declines more when you get to after the 80s, right? And this is according to the uh, World Economic Forum. Forum. And here you have the explanation how to, how to, how to really understand this graph. Um, but in the end, the key takeaway that I think everyone agrees is that um, fewer people in the lower and the middle classes are climbing that economic ladder, are doing better than the part, but are better off than their parents. I, I think that it's so obvious um, that we almost um, don't need justification or don't not don't need um, an argument for this. But um, I always think that it, while it's that is tempting to uh, take things for granted, I, I don't want you and I don't want to do that. So that's why I had these different graphs. And I invite you to actually read the, the entire report by clicking this link uh, because it's very telling, right? Um, then we come to Sandals, um, Sandals, the tyranny of merit, right? And I'm just gonna play a clip from him and then um, I will link this idea of merit and what Michael Sandals called the tyranny of merit with the religious roots of the tyranny of merit. And I want you to uh, reflect on how this masked faith-based ideology of merit uh, can be seen in multiple aspects of the media scape. Uh, so not only on the news, which you would think that's where the space for meritocratic debates to take place, but especially in advertising, uh, sports, sports casting, uh, in films, especially blockbuster films, where can you see these debates implicitly and not so much explicitly, but sometimes even explicitly. But I'm more interested in the implicit because the implicit you were easy to swallow without even, and it were, it's easy to swallow and digest without, uh, without all our knowledge unknowingly, right? So let me play then uh, Michael Sandler's take on the tyranny of merit, and then I'll say a little bit about this faith-based connection with the ideology of merit. So your book, of course, is The Tyranny of Merit. And it, it almost sounds a little bit counterintuitive. If you're me sitting in you know, class-ridden Britain, you look at the United right. States and you think, wow, it's not about class there, it's about merit. And if you try hard, you can succeed. But you're saying that that now is a false narrative, that, that, that class is, is one thing, but also meritocracy is not what it used to be. Tell me what how you analyze the reality in that regard. Right. There are two problems, Christiane. One of them is that we don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess. At Ivy League universities in the U.S., for example, despite generous financial assistance for students from poor families, still, there are more students in these places from the top 1% 
than from the entire bottom half of the country combined. So the opportunity to rise, individual mobility, which is one of the great promises of the American dream that has attracted people around the world, doesn't quite fit the facts on the ground. It's harder to rise in the US and in Britain than in many other places, many European countries than in Canada. That's one problem. But there's a deeper problem, which is the meritocratic ideal that if you work hard, you can rise, you can overcome the inequality we've experienced in recent decades through individual mobility. That ideal is flawed, at least so I try to argue in the book. It's corrosive of the common good because it leads the successful, those who land on top, to believe that their success is their own doing and that they therefore deserve the bounty um, the market bestows on them, and by implication, that those on the bottom must deserve their fate as well. And this set of attitudes, these attitudes towards success that have accompanied the growing inequality of recent decades, this, I think, accounts for the deep resentments and anger and sense of grievance by many working people who have fueled the populist authoritarian backlash against mainstream parties and governing elites. All right, so if you go back in history to the 1600s and the, the American colonies in the eastern part of the US, um, the Mayflower and the Puritans, and you, uh, you go to John Calvin, and his ideas around predestination, you realize how merit is closely linked to, uh, to the idea of being called by God into heaven. And I'll explain, briefly explain this. So merit is moral, it's always morally framed. Right, you work hard, you deserve it. But why? Who's giving you uh, the acknowledgement that you deserve? Who's giving you that deserving check? Uh, society. But beyond that, who is the ultimate authority authority of that deserving? Because uh, there is not an institution that gives you exactly a check on merit. Merit is very vague. But if you trace it back to its to its origins you can see it in Joel Calvin's reading and the Max Weber in the, in uh, the spirit of capitalism. And um, I forgot the titles, uh, sorry, the title of the book escapes me. It's the spirit of capitalism and, and, and Protestant religion, something like that. It's, um, it's probably not the actual title, but uh, Max Weber was one of the first ones of what most prominent sociologists in the 19th century who actually went and traced this, the, the idea of merit and economic thinking uh, with uh, Protestant religion, and especially with Calvinistic ideas, John Calvin's ideas in, in the important times in the 1600s. And, and it's linked to the idea of predestination, the idea of, of, of having a calling. Predestination has to do with a certain uh, certain people are predestined to go to heaven and certain people are predestined to go to hell. And the only way to, to there is no way for anyone to know whose calling is God, um, is God granted. You can only secure your calling through your diligence. And through, through your diligence, you will be benefited by God's gifts, right? You will be gifted. Your effort will be gifted. And if your effort is gifted and recognized, that is a sign that you're predestined to go to heaven. And that was very basically and very in very simple, brief, simple terms. That was John Calvin's ideas around predestination and how it was tied 
to uh, economic thinking and to the entrepreneurial spirit, right? That you can see at the time in 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 the in puritanical societies of the 1600s. Um, so then this conflation of talent and effort that is at the base of, merit of meritocracy, it's the justification for at that moment, a very basic division between those that go to heaven and those that go to hell. But then, then that is evolved into this caste-like system, into this stratification of society divided to merits um, that in which that has secularized the Calvinistic origins uh, of uh, and predestination ideas around God gift or God given talents has secularized that and has created a faith really an ideology faith based ideology that is masked as economic rationality in which the distribution of task in a society who does the basically labor uh, and wealth accumulated through labor is justified according to and and undeserved and deserved merits right that is basically the connection and sandal goes into this idea uh, of this religious origins of meritocracy right and what and goes precisely with Weber and looking at Weber's reflection on 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 economic fortunes. And in the end, the the main issue that we that 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 this uh, evolution of thinking creates, the main problem that it creates, is that it becomes a transversal elitist idea. Uh, an, an ideology that is transversal across different elites, whether they're from the right, the left, the cent or the center. Then you can see it uh, in Barack Obama's uh, speeches around, um, for instance, uh, around black fathers, the responsibility of black fathers and in the black community. If you go back to those first speeches in 2009, 2008 and 2009, uh, they have uh, the taint of meritocracy. But then Larry Summers, who was his economic advisors, he clearly put it. And Larry Summers was uh, economic advisor to Barack Obama, but then was the president of um, Harvard. He put it um, basically very bluntly when he says, and I quote here, one of the challenges in our society is that the truth is a kind of disequalized. If you see the religious tones of it, that the truth, uh, something as vague and as mysterious as the truth, uh, is, uh, it's a kind of disequalizer. Right? It's what creates is the truth is the source of inequality, a very religious undertones in here. One of the reasons that, that inequality has probably gone up in our society is that people have been treated closer to, to the way that they're supposed to be treated. Again, you're supposed, you're poor because you deserve to be poor because you make the wrong choices in life and you forget any type of systemic approach to this. And this is transversal, right? And this is transversal to different uh, elitist groups or elite groups. Um, and when I say elite groups, really, um, I, I think it's a fitting term for um, those with, mm, with certain amounts of power over, mm, over, 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 over population, over the population, right? Whether they are government official, whether they are media figures, um, or economic elites, right? There is a, there is a discourse around meritocracy. Um, and, and this is something that I want you to reflect on when you're looking at different type of media discourses, because really uh, the discourse, the meritocratic discourse is the gold standard of any social analysis that you usually see on mainstream media. And, and mainstream media in the news 
uh, it's uh, it's probably harder to decipher because it's sort of sandwiched between information and opinion, and you don't see uh, uh, opinion. You have to go and look for opinion pieces uh, in in the vast landscape that is um, the the news, uh, the me the media news, right? So, uh, but it's probably easier to see it in film uh, and in, especially in sports casting when have all the discourses around sports has to do with meritocracy, right? And and in the end, we're generally bombarded with with stories of rack to riches. Uh, if you look at most films, they all have to do with this idea of the underdog somehow winning, right? Rack to riches stories are everywhere. Um, another, another symptom of this meritocratic Another, actually, more precisely, uh, another feature or aspect of this meritocratic debate has to do with how meritocratic meritocracy is treated, and it's, uh, it's usually talked about as an atmospheric phenomenon, as something that somehow just fall upon people uh, and put them in that order. In, and there is very little talk about the different histories or um, or, or or structures around that how that system came about right uh, that's why you can see this across different type of elites whether they are media elites government elites economic elites political elites um and again i think even though you know it, it, elites might might sound as a sort of an umbrella term uh, i think it's very fitting when it comes to meritocracy precisely because meritocracy is a hierarchy and those at the top of the hierarchy are elite uh, are could be basically termed as elites right so with the did within this ideology the idea of an, an self-justifying elite uh, is fitting um and then we're gonna I, I want to show you very briefly uh how in a in in a how Fari Zakaria talks about the idea of meritocracy, and this is on CNN, so that's why I I, uh, I consciously picked CNN just as to show that this is not really a left or right, it's not a partisan uh, issue, but it's really transversal across these meritocratic elites. In recent weeks, you will have heard or read about two seemingly unrelated issues. In New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio has signaled his desire to scrap the highly competitive exams for eight New York public schools. In Boston, there were new revelations from a lawsuit against Harvard University that alleges the university systematically discriminates against Asian Americans in its admissions process. These come from very different directions, but they represent an assault on one of the foundations of modern society, the meritocracy. The meritocracy is now an idea under siege. On the right, many of Donald Trump's supporters see it as a code word for an out-of-touch establishment that looks down on ordinary, hardworking Americans. Here in Britain, Theresa May's call for a more meritocratic society was assailed on the left by those who saw it as a concept that breeds elitism and inequality. Until the 1950s, America was run in every corridor of power by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men. That WASP aristocracy was slowly but surely dislodged through the rise of merit-based systems, largely in education, that opened up elite institutions to people of talent, no matter their background. So just let me pause in here. So what he's saying, which is, I'll, I'll kind of go later and try to unpick this, and I'll do it very briefly, but you'll have it there. But you see the rhetorical jump that he's doing. Like in the 50s, People, basically white rich men were ruling uh, the US and through education, and this is why I pause it here, because I want you to, I really want you to pay attention to how education is always, is the main, is the main biggest discursive weapon in the arsenal of meritocracy, how education takes everybody up a notch and is the, is, is, is the mm, most cherished, asset of any meritocratic society, how that somehow from the 50s onward, then anyone with talent could rise 
to the ranks of the meritocratic ladder. The problem with that is what happened to those who didn't. And there are many who didn't. In fact, most people in the U.S. do not have a four-year college degree. It's only one-third in the U.S. that have a, a college degree, a four-year college degree. Right? Most people in the U.S. do not have a college degree or have basically a technical vocational college degree. Um, so that begs the question, why those people didn't get it? Um, or why those people couldn't get it, basically? Yeah, according to Farid, it would be because they don't deserve it, because they, didn't, they were not talented enough, according to this logic. Let's first talk about the New York challenge to meritocracy. Its eight selective schools are a wonder of the modern public education system. Admission to them is based on a single test. Having wealth or connections will not get you in, nor will your race or athletic prowess. These schools have an astonishing track record of moving smart kids out of poverty and into the middle class. But it turns out... Moving the smart kids out of poverty, factually wrong, really. Those elite high schools are for the elite, and I actually know them very well. And it, it, they're magnet schools, called magnet schools, basically. And low-income people are basically locked out just because the tuitions are mad and they have very few scholarships and they have STEM scholarships. Uh, but most of the students in these schools are well-to-do students uh, for the upper middle class and upper classes of New York in these specific cities. Uh, but of course, that is out of the picture in here. That Blacks and Hispanics comprise just 10% of these schools compared with the 68% of the city's student body as a whole. The tests are thus said to favor one group, Asians, who make up more than 60% of the students. But to complain that the schools have a diversity problem, as the mayor does, is wrong and wrong-headed. First, these schools are incredibly diverse. The category called Asians actually encompasses people that trace their ancestry to China, South Korea, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and the Philippines, among others, wildly different countries and cultures. Perhaps. See the rhetorical pirouette here of, of conflating how Asian is very diverse in and of itself and that would justify uh, that these schools are not diverse enough. In fact, they're very diverse because different age, the term Asians is diverse in and of itself with the, the problem of these schools of how many different type of, let's say, intra-ethnic Asian minorities there are in these schools. That is never talked about, but if you actually get into who's, uh, who, who's, which Asians are, Asians are going to these schools, they're mostly Koreans or Chinese, which are the, by, by far the more, more well-to-do uh, Asian Americans in, in the US. So all of these other categories of, of Asians are not represented in these in these eight schools, uh, if you actually look into it, so, but that of course that's, that that is never said, and, and and that's the point that I'm trying to make here. And if you, and I think it's I already kind of like made the point um, that the point is made. Uh, if if you watch this clip, it's very easy to digest that. Of course, we need. Uh, a meritocratic society. Of course, we should do everything for a meritoc for the meritocracy to keep on living, right? Um, but it's only when you pause it and unpick this media, these courses around merit meritocracy, that you can start realizing uh, not only some of the untruths um, around uh, meritocrat the facts. Of, merit of meritocracy when you really unpicked uh, what's behind, but also how out of context these discourses are. When you put them in context, you can dismantle this Farid's take on meritocracy and, 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 understand, and really see that historically, meritocracy is simply an ideological justification for inequality. Right, and I've made six points in here, and I'll go very quickly through them, just so you have them in here. Uh, and the, the main one is that that was Paris cryptocracy that in the, in the, the clip was talking about is still in place. 
it hasn't gone away. And in fact, and even more ironical, ironically, uh, those WASP aristocrats, like the Carnegie's, the Vanderbilt's, the Rockefeller in the Gilded Age in the late 19th, early 20th century, those were precisely, their, those fortunes in the Gilded Age were precisely justified through their business acumen, through their merits, so how savvy these um, this very wealthy barons were, right? Um, and that goes to this day. Um, and, and then we get into the into into this model minority myth when it comes to the to the U.S. and the high achieving Asian myth. Um, and the main issue with this is not only that it's not true, uh, because it's very factually untrue. Um, when it comes, not so much the facts, but the reasoning and the discourse is what is not factually true. Uh, and the main problem is it's basically used as racial wedge to forget or at least minimize the role played by all this uh, systemic discrimination of slavery uh, or different type of economic inequalities, engineered economic inequalities. I'm thinking here of red zoning. If you uh, you can just simply Google about red zoning in the U.S. and then you'll you know you'll see what I what I'm referring about. Uh, but another fact is that um, you kind of compare apples and oranges. Uh, Asian American immigration cannot be compared to uh, and to um, Latino and especially not to uh, um, to African American. Uh, population in the U.S. And that has to do, one of the main uh, issues with this comparison is that most vastly, the vast majority of Asian Americans came after uh, after 1965 and the immigration national, and when the Immigration Nationally Act was passed that allowed them to migrate uh, into the U.S. because before they were uh, labeled as undesirable. That therefore they avoided the harshest uh, discrimination laws in the U.S. It's precisely in the 60s and the 70s when you get the civil rights movement that it's advancing and progressing uh, much of the discrimination uh, and it's fighting much of the discrimination laws in the country. And Asian Americans benefited from that naturally uh, by um, none of their fault, right? But it's a historical context that needs to be taken into account. This means that many of these uh, Asian American migrants could live in relatively better areas, which in the, especially in the US means that they can live, uh, they, they can go to better school and they benefited better from better schools, which then uh, um, is one of the reasons for their, um, their higher success in education, right? And if you wanna see more about this, just read these uh, two reports uh, which are not very long on on Asian American and Hispanic children in the U.S. And here it's just another graph, just basically saying uh, how basically whites and Asians live in areas with better schools, uh, and it, it's it's um, it's very obvious. Um, and Daniel Markovitz is another one that has written extensively on. Um, meritocracy and the sham of meritocracy. And he refers precisely on the gaps of education. He put it very eloquently. So uh, I have, I want us to spend a couple of minutes listening to Markovitz and his take on, on how the gap of, edu of education is, uh, is explained uh, through this meritocratic lens. lens. Plays out. So this starts uh, long before people are even born. If you look at the family structure of rich families and the family structure of middle class and poor families, rich kids are much, much more likely to be born into families with both parents still in the household. If you are uh, a woman without a high school degree or even with a high school degree but no college degree in the United States today, you will have roughly 60% of your children outside of wedlock. Mm -hmm. If you're a woman with a graduate degree, you'll have only 5% of your children outside of wedlock. So right from the get-go, kids of rich, educated parents have both parents in the household and other kids usually don't. 
And then the rich parents just start spending money on their kids. You know, a typical public high school in the United States spends maybe $15,000 a year per child to educate the kids. A really poor high school might spend eight or $10,000 a year. So that's a gap of about $5,000. Mm -hmm. But the top 20 private schools as measured by Forbes spend on average $75,000 a year per child to educate their kids. And all that money buys results. It buys training, it buys teacher attention, it buys careful educational programs. And when it comes time to take the SAT, for example, mm. kids whose parents earn more than $200,000 a year have 250 point higher scores on average than middle class kids. Even as middle class kids have just 125 points higher on average than kids below the poverty line. So the gap between the very wealthy and the middle class is much higher than the middle class and the poor. Much higher, twice as big on the SAT. And on other measures, the gap is, is even bigger. And the gap between the rich and the poor is. You see, so income equates and, co and correlates um, academic achievement. And that's the case for every single metric that you look at in at least in the countries that I know best, which is Spain, the US and Australia too. Um, and this is so obvious um, that, but it's so obviated when it comes to meritocracy, when you look, especially when it comes to meritocracy in education, precisely because myths around how to achieve what you achieved are self-justified through individual examples and exceptions. Uh, there is very few discourses on the media that actually um, uh, get into contextual historical explanations and bigger picture, why is it that certain people are doing in a certain way? It's very few deep dives on this. And when we look into higher education, which is what I know the most, I've been working in higher education for, uh, being involved with higher education basically all my life and now teaching for more than 10 years in higher education. Uh, the problem that comes up that with the meritocratic, the supposedly meritocratic system of our education is that it's very artificial. All these rankings of schools are very artificial. Uh, they are based on metrics that are very vague, very abstract, um, that has to do more with reputation and compounded reputation uh, and with uh, private institutions that benefit precisely from those rankings and universities buy into those rankings because it benefits. So it's that sort of like uh, self-fulfilling prophecy type of ranking. Um, and if you further analyze this artificiality, you can look at how precisely tests, any, any teacher will tell you this, that tests do not measure by far do not measure knowledge or intelligence. They simply are a measure of your ability to complete a task. You're given a task and you can complete it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you know something. Um, because intelligence and knowledge are very complex and it really takes a lifetime uh, to understand certain very complex topics. And you're not gonna master a very complex topic in, in a semester or even in four years, right? So tests simply are a measurement of your ability to complete task, to follow an order, uh, to put it you know, bluntly. So then we have to uh, ask ourselves, how is it that high, the value is accrued through higher education? And how is that connected to wealth accumulation after you graduate, how those two things are connected. Within higher education, that connected through merit, that is talent and effort, uh, through the scrutiny 
of this talent and this effort and that is put into that the outcome of that talent through the honest scrutiny of the outcome that goes into the talent and the effort in higher education that and it's, and that not a scrutiny carries forward into society after graduation. And then we as a society accept that the more money we one makes has to do with more money one has in this society, right? However, this is a very dangerous and demoralizing way of organizing society. And I'll finish with a quote of Michael Sandel, right? Um, referring to how in our current society, this connection between merit, credentialism, meritocracy, and then value accumulation through money in society has led us to a time when finance, and I'll quote, has claimed a greater share of corporate profits and many who labor in the real economy, those who labor, who, those who we deem essential, right, uh, that are producing useful goods and services have not only faced stagnant wages, i.e. we, a society is signaling we value you much less and very uncertain job, pros job prospects, they also come to feel that society accords less respect to the kind of work the working class does. And that is very dangerous because we are devaluing very essential services. And this inequality, that's another very dangerous aspect of inequality, right? And you can see uh, this in many different narratives around the value of teachers versus the actual pay uh, that teachers in primary, secondary schools get, yeah. Um, so with this, I'll finish um, and uh, I'll get you to reflect on these questions for the tutorial.